Have you ever come across something that made you stop and question the evidence of your own eyes? It's a feeling that happens to everyone every now and then, and that includes archaeologists. Even though most archaeologists are trained historians who know what to expect when they go digging through the ground, they still get their minds blown occasionally. Here are just a few of the things that have blown their minds. Can the history of human settlement in North America be rewritten by the discovery of a few ancient footprints? Perhaps so, especially if we're talking about this collection of 29 footprints on the Pacific coast of Canada. Scientists say that they date back to the end of the last ice age, which makes them the oldest known footprints on the North American continent. They were first discovered on Calvert Island, British Columbia in 2014. Conditions on this part of the coast have preserved the prints so perfectly that it's still possible to see the heel marks, toes, and even arches of every foot. There are three different sets of footprints here, two adults and a child. That implies that they might have been made by a nomadic family out looking for food or shelter some 13,300 years ago. The date comes from radiocarbon tests carried out on sediments and two small pieces of preserved wood found within the prints. This part of the Pacific coast is covered by bogs and rainforests today, but 13,000 years ago, it would have partially frozen. It might even be the case that these people arrived by boat, as they'd have needed one to cross Calvert Island as it was back then. The lost Greek city of Tenea had been lost for such a long time that archaeologists had almost given up any hope of finding it. The name Tenea turns up in ancient writings regularly, and goods said to have been made in Tenea change hands for high prices on the antique market, but the location of the city itself seemed to be impossible to pinpoint until Greek archaeologist Elena Korka did precisely that in November 2018. She says that Tenea once stood in the southern Peloponnese region of Greece, and she backs the claim up with the discovery of jewelry, coins, the remains of housing settlements, and burial sites that all imply there was a settlement of significant size here roughly 1,700 years ago. The graves are designed in the Hellenistic style, and the coins are valuable, which is consistent with an affluent town full of wealth and trade. That's consistent with ancient descriptions of Tenea. Legend has it that this city was founded by the survivors of the Trojan War. There's work to be done before that can be proven, but at least we finally know where to start digging. The tales that are told about Knossos are so rich and elaborate that it's difficult to know where the fiction ends and the facts begin. To many archaeologists, this is the first city ever to be founded in Europe. You'll find what's left of it on the island of Crete, where it's classed as a Bronze Age archaeological site. The truth is that it might be far older than that. There's evidence that humans settled here as long ago as the Neolithic era. The palace that was built in Knossos, some of which still stands, was the epicenter of the once mighty Minoan civilization. It was abandoned for unknown reasons approximately 3,400 years ago. Back when it was built around 4,000 years ago, it sat in the middle of a town of perhaps 18,000 people. Within 300 years, the population had swollen to around 100,000. As for the famous labyrinth with its minotaur, which is said to exist beneath the palace, Archaeologists haven't found that yet, but they're still looking. The Terracotta Army is one of the most famous Chinese archaeological discoveries of all time. The army is said to stand guard over the tomb of Qin Shi Huang, the first Chinese emperor. The problem is that his tomb is an enormous and dangerous place, and his body is yet to be found. As well protected and preserved as the Terracotta Army is, they look very different now than they did when they were first discovered in 1974. Back then, they were far more colorful. The burial site was so perfectly preserved that the air hadn't touched the sculptures for over 2,200 years. When it eventually did, the colors faded, and the paint crumbled almost immediately, despite the best efforts of experts to preserve them. Now, 
the colors can only be seen in pictures taken at the time they were found. The possibility of repainting the sculptures and restoring the colors has been discussed many times, but archaeologists are reluctant to interfere with the statues any more than they've already been interfered with. Perhaps it's best to enjoy the photos and leave the ancient statues alone. The site of Sutton Hoo in England is, with the possible exception of Stonehenge, the most famous archaeological hotspot in the country. It's where the world-famous Sutton Hoo helmet was found. According to a study that was published in January 2021, it was also likely the very last large-scale Anglo-Saxon boat burial of its kind. The site of Sutton Hill is around 1,500 years old and was discovered in 1939. The enormous burial mound contained a whole ship, along with a lavish set of grave goods unlike anything that British archaeologists had come across before. It was considered such a significant discovery that it forced historians to second-guess everything they thought they knew about Britain in the medieval era. Just 100 years after the Sutton Hoo burial event, though, the concept of burial mounds and grave goods in England had been forgotten. This is thought to be largely down to the emergence of English royal families, which sucked up the land and resources and took wealth away from regional leaders and nobles. Christianity also began to take hold in the 8th century, which encouraged less ostentatious burials. Whoever the Anglo-Saxon king who was buried at Sutton Hoo was, he may well have been the last of his kind. Several thousand years ago, the city of Petra was a thriving metropolis. The people who lived here were probably the envy of everyone else in the region. Today, it's empty, forgotten, and as dry as a bone. Only the occasional piece of evidence, like the stunning doorway to the treasury that was carved into the sandstone by the local Nabataeans during the second century, offers any clue to the magnificence that once existed here. Ancient records tells us that this was the capital of the Nabataean Empire for a period that began 2,400 years ago and ended 500 years later. At some point after that, it was abandoned and unknown to anyone other than the Bedouins. After its rediscovery by a European traveler disguised as a Bedouin in the 19th century, it became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1985 and then one of the new Seven Wonders of the World in 2007. Even now, experts believe they've only found about 15% of the city. The remaining 85% is still hidden beneath the ground and still waiting to be explored. There's a cave in Spain that contains some of the most ancient artwork in Europe. You can go see it if you like, but there are plenty of people who think you shouldn't. The Altamira cave paintings are held in such high regard that the caves have been nicknamed the Sistine Chapel of the Paleolithic Era, but damage is caused to the ancient paintings every time groups of humans come near them. That's why many experts believe they ought to be off-limits for the sake of preservation. The caverns, which are in the country's Cantabria region, have been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1985. The paintings that adorn their walls and ceilings range in age between 20,000 and 14,000 years. It's thought that different groups of humans lived inside the caves between those times. Most of the art depicts animals local to the area, like bison and bulls, although there are also human figures and a few abstract shapes. Science tells us that every time groups of visitors have been allowed in to see the paintings firsthand, their head perspiration, and breathing damage the delicate artwork. Nevertheless, the money generated by tourism dictates that the visits continue. Most people have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but very few people understand what they are. For a start, they're not a single archaeological artifact or discovery. The Dead Sea Scrolls have been recovered fragment by fragment over a period of many years, just when it seemed like we were never going to find any more pieces, several more fragments turned up in a Judean desert cave believed to have been used by Jewish refugees some 1,900 years ago. They contain pieces of text from the Hebrew Bible, 
and are thought to be connected to similar fragments found inside the notorious Cave of Horror in Israel 60 years earlier. Those pieces from the 1940s include verses from the Book of Nahum and of Zechariah and were placed back on display to the public to celebrate the discovery of their companion fragments. Trying to put everything back together is like trying to complete the oldest, most delicate, and most valuable jigsaw puzzle ever made. Even now, though, we don't have all the pieces. There might be other fragments in other caves, and it might take us another 60 years to recover them. Psychoactive, mind-altering drugs have appealed to human beings for as long as we've known that such substances exist. But the reasons that we take them have changed dramatically over time. To explain what we mean, let's take a look inside this shaman's bag. It was found inside a rock shelter in Bolivia, high in the Andes mountain range in 2019, where the climate has preserved it for about 1,000 years. The bag is made of leather, and inside it are the basic ingredients of ayahuasca. Mix these ingredients together into a drink, tip it down your throat, and you'd soon be experiencing intense hallucinations. To a shaman, these visions contained the secrets of the future. The visions were to be experienced by the shaman alone, so they'd often travel to a remote rock shelter like the one this was found at to go about their rituals in solitude. Also inside the bag were wooden tablets for snuffing, llama bone spatulas, and a pouch made of fox snouts. It's likely that the shaman considered all of these objects to be sacred, so we're left to wonder why they were abandoned in the rock shelter. The most likely but unpleasant explanation might be that the shaman fell to his death while on his hallucinogenic trip. Who painted these shells? And why is it important? The answer to that question is that if archaeologists are right in their suspicions about who may have painted it, it changes our perception of Neanderthals. The shells come from Spain and are among a collection of artifacts that Spanish archaeologists believe might have been body ornaments, cosmetics, or both. In other words, they think that Neanderthals wore jewelry and painted their faces and bodies with a primitive form of makeup. That's far beyond the level of self-awareness and inventiveness we usually credit Neanderthals with. The shells contain small holes, which would have allowed string to be passed through them so they could be worn as a necklace and the surface of the shell contains the glittering remains of a makeup substance. The substance could only be made by mixing pigments from different ingredients, which is evidence of substantial planning. Some experts claim that the Neanderthals simply scavenged these objects from more intelligent early humans, but that doesn't fit the timeline. Modern humans didn't reach Europe until 40,000 years ago. These artifacts are closer to 50,000. From now on, when we think of Neanderthals, we'll imagine them wearing blush. A civilization is nothing without a code of laws for its members to abide by. No matter where you live in the world, it's likely that your local code of laws is at least partially derived from the Code of Hammurabi. These early laws are carved into a stone monument and named after King Hammurabi of Babylon. That helps us date the artifact because Hammurabi ruled about 3,800 years ago. Now known as the Louvre Steel, the artifact lays down more than a few ground rules and legal requirements. In fact, there are 282 of them in total. These rules deal with both civil and business matters. For example, fines for uncivil behavior and harsher punishments for dishonest business conduct. The principles of the text, which is written in Akkadian, are surprisingly forward-thinking for something so old. The first states that laws should exist to protect the weak from oppression by the rich and powerful. The second says that everyone is entitled to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. You can't even guarantee that basic freedom in some parts of the world today. In February 2020, a team of archaeologists claimed to have discovered the tomb of Romulus, founding father of Rome in Italy. That news came as a huge surprise to most historians and archaeologists, who've long believed that both Romulus and Remus were mythical figures. 
While there's an argument about the owner of the tomb, what everybody can agree on is that it's very old, and it was made for someone extremely important. Archaeologists think that it was created about 2,600 years ago, and point to the presence of a circle altar inside the tomb as evidence that it's not your average ancient Roman tomb. The often told legend about the founding of Rome is that Romulus declared it on Palatine Hill in the year 753 BCE after he murdered Remus, his own twin. No supporting evidence for that version of events has ever been found. It's unlikely that this discovery will be classed as supporting evidence by those who refuse to believe Romulus existed because the sarcophagus in the tomb is empty. If Romulus was ever here at all, it seems someone took him and reburied him a very long time ago. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!